There's a house on Sycamore that's below me. And <clears throat> on the one side, uh, the bank took it over. They sent a group of men from Pittsburgh to come and clean it out and everything, and they did that. And of course, it's still a disaster. But the bank took it over. Now the other side, I don't know what's going to happen because it's a split marriage. And I don't know, the owner keeps saying he's going to come back. Well, I don't think he'll ever come back. Uh, but anyways, uh, and then on also on Sycamore, there's another home, but it's not bad as far as appearance is concerned. The bank has, had taken it over for a couple of years. Now, how long, does anybody know, when the bank takes these over, they could just sit back and relax for the next 50 years? And, and that's the problem. That, that's the worst case scenario that we, we handle. When a bank takes it over, if it goes into foreclosure, then our hands are tied. We really can't do anything unless we go to the township officials and say, look, this place is deplorable. We really need to do something in an emergency type situation. Fortunately, that hasn't happened in, in, within this jurisdiction. It's happened in other places that I've worked. But it, I agree with you. Whenever a bank takes over a property, and I know the properties you're talking about because I'm in litigation with those properties, and it, it, it's just a long, drawn-out process. But why does the bank do that? I don't understand that. They were behind on their mortgage payment, and so the bank, there was no, the bank had to protect its interest, and so they fit it in and got the property. They don't want to have these properties. Mm -hmm. They're not good landlords. There's a list. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about here. There's a list that the bank sends out to certain people. I used to get it until maybe four or five years ago of all the repos that they have that they want rid of. They don't want to be a landlord. They want rid of the property. Well, the one, one has a sign that it's for sale, the, the bank side, but I, I just, well, I, I understand that yeah, it's just, They have to maintain it like any other property owner would. They, they, they stall off as long as they can because they don't live in a neighborhood, like if it's a PNC or something like that, they, they don't, they, they, they'll obey the law if they get cited for it, but again, it's like pulling teeth. Doesn't most of the banks, after a while, send them to the sheriff sale for a sheriff sale? Yes. No. Yeah. Well, they've already done that. We're, we're assuming that the bank owns it. They've yeah. already sheriff sold it. They, they, they own it now. Just like you own your house or you own your house, the bank owns that. So we can't, unless we can uh, go through it and, and But then can't these. they still put it up for a sheriff sale and people could go and bid on it, but the, the, sh the well, bank could no, put no, a no, minimum that they will accept? Call the bank. Okay, I bought one through a sheriff sale, but it was the bank that was taking it to the sheriff. Right. Okay. And they said, I knew before I even attended the sheriff sale what was the minimum right. we were going to be able to pay sale. for it. But if nobody bids out above the bank and the bank gets stuck with it, then, then they're the only yeah, then so they're that's the owner. Yeah, that's the next process, or that's the next step. Right. If, if, it, if it was in such a condition that could be uh, condemned, we we could go through that process to condemn a house, whether it's a bank owned or if you own it. So the process isn't any different. But uh, th this board, we would spend the money and tear down these houses that could be condemned. It's not an issue of us not wanting to spend the money. If the property owner resists or, or will not cooperate, then it's a, that's what becomes a year long, I mean, many year legal fight to be able to accomplish that. So I, I think I told you that last time that if you go after a house that the owner says go ahead take it, they, they don't want to spend the ten thousand dollars to tear it down. They don't have it. They say go ahead and tear it down. We would leave. We would tear it down, spend the ten thousand, and then uh, leave the property to, to you know to make the taxpayers whole again. But uh, if, if, if so, well, but if somebody fights it, it, it's it's a long process. And we well know what the change. Speaking about properties right now, as, as on my list, we live on Maple Street. Um, across the back alley from Maple Street, there's some areas that have really thick, dead brush in them. Weeds growing up that dead, the die over the winter, whatever. It, there's a good fire hazard there that 
you know, on a potential dry and windy event of a day, like today before it rained, or you know, early spring, late fall. If that happens to catch, you're dealing with a multi department call, possibly potentially a, multi, a couple hundred acre forest fire going on. And I know that it's owned by Costi or A and B or whatever you guys said earlier tonight. But if there's any way that they could remediate that brush and get it out of there, at least close to the road, someone throws a stick <coughs> on a windy day going down the street, you're talking to fire. And the, our fire department, the entire township probably couldn't handle if it was windy. See, so our hands are tied. When we take somebody to the magistrate, it's normally because it's a developed property, vacant property, or um, like like. The, the hundreds of acres of abandoned slate dump, the, the, it's not the same kind of uh, uh, enforcement powers we have. Are private residents able to do it on their own to mitigate that closest to the road? They don't own that property. What happens to them? I don't think anybody would care. Okay, good enough. <laughs> good enough. Thank you. So that part you said ADV owns? Uh, I don't know exactly where it's from. Most likely, I think Behind it's... Maple, there's an alley, and you're probably familiar with it because a tree came down uh, from lightning, a dead tree, and smashed a car back there. Do you happen to know who owns that part of the property? Because our neighbor, Mr. Chuck, manually, with a chainsaw, with the help of my husband, yeah. took that tree down and off and apart, and the fire department just cleared it from the road. But after that, it was still completely on a car and you know, just a complete hazard with glass and everything and we have our kids out you know playing our backyard. See, I think well, ABBO is most of the property that, that abuts the, the, our property owners in use. Koski owns like a, a big wedge above where, where um, the, the, the road would have to go for the ABB property to touch uh, the school property. It has to go through Koski property but I don't think Koski comes all the way down to the village. He's on the so, other side so, of Willow. Right, so, so that's, that's probably all ABB. Yeah, he's on the other side of Willow. Okay. I mean, I, last year it took me uh, three and a half days with uh, our neighbor to clear that tree. There's other trees on that back uh, next to the road that can come down on the property owners that live on Maple, mm -hmm. uh, go across the street, blocking the street from traffic and everything else, not to mention the neighboring lives and uh, people who park back there, their fences, or their yards, sheds, you name it. Yeah. Um, that they're well over 100, 160 feet, 180 feet tall, and they are completely dead, hollowed out. One good windstorm, well, one good the, the strike. The car that was damaged, did that property owner uh, contact ABB make an insurance claim? Nope. I honestly don't know. I think the reason why the property owner who lost the vehicle and that didn't contact uh, ABB is because that the car that was damaged was already owned by the bank <laughs> and was hidden back there. <laughs> and that car sat there for a couple of years because it was unregistered and had no proper tags on it, and it would never—it had never moved since we moved in. Yeah. Um, and there's been several cars back there, and I think the the, the code enforcement officer has helped in that issue recently, or whomever has helped in the private property issue recently, because a lot less unused cars are back there. And I right. I applaud you for doing that. That's yeah, what you guys did. I sent several letters out. Yeah. And I'm going after the car owners which I normally don't do, I usually go after the property owner, but like Mr. Cassiola said, when you're dealing with a large parcel of land with an entity that owns it out of state, you're not going to get any response, therefore I go after the vehicle owner in those I cases. have no problem personally to take care of that entire area back there. I like doing that stuff. I mean, that's I'm just not going to get permission to do it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not asking for permission for many of you guys, but that's the legal issue. That's why we were just curious who owns it because that tree that came down, we normally park there as well. We just happened to be gone that day, otherwise that tree would come down on our cars as well. Yep. And there's other dead trees, so we didn't know who actually owns all that, who we would call to like report if a tree got hit by lightning again and came down or something like that. Well, we weren't no sure. We don't have a problem calling ABB and just letting them know that, that there's a it was a dangerous situation, but I don't know their, their obligation. That they're going to do anything, yeah. Okay. I'm just curious. It's useless land. They're not going to lose a diet or a burn or not, but it's going to cause a major issue. Anything else, sir? Any other things of interest? Yeah, you all. You said something about the speed limit signs. Yeah, you could uh, 